Hello. My name is Daisy Brown. I am the webmaster for the cyber chapter of the Association of Legal Administrators. Thank you for joining us today. During the session, everyone is muted except for myself and the speaker. Please type your questions in the chat window. Uh, the speaker may answer your questions as we go along, but in any event, we'll always answer your questions during the Q&A at the end of this session. For confidentiality, only myself and the speaker will be able to see your questions. Uh, the live webinar qualifies you for one CLM credit. It can be used towards your recertification under legal industry business management, or it can be used towards additional hours under the same topic needed by functional specialists applying for the exam, as long as the subject area is outside your area of specialty. The session is being recorded for playback at a later time. This, uh, this week you will find a link to the recording on our homepage under the webinar the banner. The recording will also be available uh, to the public from that link for 30 days or until the next webinar is uploaded. Uh, but for the Cyber Chapter members, we have access through our forum indefinitely. Please complete the evaluation questionnaire that pops up at the end. Um, it helps us uh, to know how much you like and enjoy our webinars. Um, there's also a link for that on our home page. We are ready to get started. Today's presenter is John Remsen, Jr., president of the Remsen Group. John is widely recognized as one of the country's leading authorities on law firm leadership, management, marketing, and business development. He is a frequent speaker and author on firm leadership and marketing topics. Since 1997, he has worked with over 325 law firms and thousands of lawyers. Most of his clients are mid-sized commercial law firms, ranging in size from 15 to 200 lawyers. Welcome, John. Well, uh, thank you, Daisy, and uh, welcome, everyone. Glad you're here, and uh, pleased to be appreciating uh, pr uh, presenting this topic today. It's an important one, and I find it's uh, an area that many smaller and mid-sized law firms tend to neglect. Uh, these are tough issues oftentimes, and um, I think it's important if we care about the long-term legacy of the firm and uh, its long-term sustainability that you focus proactively on succession planning. It doesn't happen naturally. And I think there are things that firms can do, if firm administrators can do, to affect good uh, planning for the future. And Daisy, thank you for your introduction. And um, as Daisy mentions, I speak quite a bit to different groups across the country, a number of ALA chapters. And if there are any chapter leaders out there interested in this topic, if there are chapters or other topics, please feel free to give us a call. Uh, I do some presentations for the ABA, the Legal Marketing Association, and other organizations as well. So uh, please consider me if you're looking for speakers, upcoming programs. Um, I've been consulting with firms for uh, about 25 years. I was in-house, a couple of big law firms, one in Florida, which is where I'm from originally, and a second firm up in Ohio. So I was a marketing guy in-house at law firms trying to affect change in the infancy of law firm marketing. And over the years, um, I've evolved and become much more well-versed and knowledgeable and, 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 you know, a variety of aspects in, involving successful firm leadership and, and strategic planning. Uh, another one of the programs I present, many of you may be familiar with, is called the Managing Partner Forum. Uh, as you all, as administrators, know, it's tough to lead lawyers. Uh, they love their autonomy. They don't like change, don't like risk. Uh, lawyers are, are indeed a tough group to lead, and they don't teach managing partners how to lead lawyers in law schools. So we've tried to create a resource, a community, um, a collection of articles. We do a weekly e-newsletter um, under the banner Managing Partner Forum, and we do leadership conferences now one a year. Our next conference, May 5th, in Atlanta, Georgia. And if you're interested in more information on it, uh, check out managingpartnerforum.org. If you'd like to subscribe to our newsletter, we put out a, an MPF weekly every week and try to showcase great articles, economic surveys, information relevant to leading a successful law firm. So as well, free, feel free to subscribe to our newsletter. It is complimentary. Go to managingpartnerforum.org. Um, and you'll also find a whole treasure trove of articles and checklists on, on, on a variety of topics, including the one we're talking about today, which is succession planning. And I, I like to, you know, think of succession planning 
through in a couple of areas. Uh, in terms of ownership of the firm, in terms of leadership and governance of the firm, and making sure we're developing and grooming our future leaders. Uh, I think it's important to look at succession through the eyes of the client, the prospective client, referral sources, folks with whom we have relationships, and make sure that relationships with our top clients, our top referral sources, don't retire when our senior partners retire. But in fact, uh, we've got younger lawyers who are stepping up and assuming these important relationships with clients and referral sources. I think as well, uh, making sure that the knowledge, the expertise that our senior partners have gathered over decades of private practice are transition to our younger lawyers. Um, I think we can look at organizational involvement, community involvement in terms of succession, making sure we, our firm has identified key organizations and our senior lawyers are helping the junior lawyers uh, ascend to leadership ranks as they uh, descend from leadership ranks in key organizations identified by the firm. Uh, the invariable, you know, what happens if one of our senior leaders gets hit by a bus uh, or leaves the firm? Uh, and making sure we're ready to respond to unforeseen situations, uh, emergencies. And then if we have some time toward the end, I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, your firm's priorities for 2016, 2017, and uh, what are you putting in play uh, today to make sure your firm achieves its long-term vision in terms of its client mix, its profitability, its profitability, its practice mix, and the like. So we'll talk about that as well. As Daisy mentions, uh, please feel free to type in questions as we go. Uh, we'll be taking a look at those and, and uh, responding to them as they come up. So uh, uh, it should be fairly self-evident how to type in some questions if you have some things you want to talk further about. And um, we, I, I'm very interested in your feedback, what you liked about the session, what you didn't like about the session as well. So uh, here we go. One of the things Daisy encouraged me to do was bring in some audience polling questions to uh, create a little interaction and engage our audience. And I think a good question to start with, and Daisy, you'll have to walk folks through how to vote, uh, is, is tell us about your firm size. And if you could press the appropriate button, and I'll try to tailor my remarks to reflect the uh, demographics of, uh, of our audience. And it looks like most of us, as the votes come in, are in the smaller firm range, less than 50 lawyers. Yeah, it looks like most of our, uh, our, our participating firms are from firms uh, with, with 50 or fewer lawyers. So uh, I'll gear my remarks best I can to try to, try to gear it toward the smaller and mid-sized law firm. So passing the torch, that's our title today. We want to make sure it's smooth, it's orderly, it's planned. And I think we should be looking at three to five year horizons of time. Uh, let's not start planning for the retirement of senior partners on the eve of their retirement. And uh, I think it's important that we, you know, look at look a little more long term, three to five years as we pass the torch. Um, I always like to set the stage with benchmarking data. I find that lawyers really respond to facts, statistics, data. What are other firms doing? So uh, I try to capture that data because it's, it's very persuasive to firm leaders that they want to affect change. Um, I'm going to share a few uh, benchmarking slides with you, and then we'll do a few more audience polling questions here as we get set up. Um, this, these next couple of slides reflect uh, information we've gleaned from 150, 100, excuse me, 180 managing partners through audience polling technology. Uh, at our managing partner conferences, we give everybody a voting gizmo and think Regis Philbin asks the audience, kind of like the polling questions we're doing here. So uh, I'll present to you uh, a few slides here uh, of, of data we've collected in recent managing partner conferences reflecting input from 180 managing partners, uh, mostly from mid-sized law firms. Uh, one of the questions we posed at a couple of recent conferences was, uh, the statement presented was our firm does a good job with succession planning and implementation. And looking here at the number of firms that strongly agree, somewhat disagree, or are ambivalent toward that statement, uh, it certainly reflects the fact that most mid-sized firms, the leaders of those firms, will admit we don't do a particularly good job when it comes to succession planning and the implementation of succession plans. 
Um, in terms of job descriptions, I'm going to share that with you, how many managing partners have a formal written job description. But before I share with you that data, let's ask our audience uh, whether or not it has formal job descriptions for its firm leaders, the managing partners, the practice group leaders, the department heads. Uh, do they know what they're supposed to be doing in terms of time commitment, in terms of what you expect of your firm leaders? And not surprisingly, it looks like almost two-thirds say, no, um, we don't have formal job descriptions for our firm leaders. I think it's, per it's important uh, that your managing partner, your department heads, have some idea what's expected of them in that role. What do we expect them to be doing? How much time do we expect them to dedicate to the role? Are we providing training or any uh, sort of resources to our firm leaders? Or are we kind of putting them out there trying to figure it out on their own? Believe me, the AMLAW 200, the NLJ 250 are investing quite a bit of resources and training and developing the leadership skills of their firm leaders. Uh, practice group leadership, a really, really hot topic right now. And um, most firms... Uh, I think can it stand to improve in this area. Uh, if you are interested in managing partner job descriptions, for example, John McCalick, former president of ALA, wrote a book not long ago called The Extraordinary Managing Partner. He has a complimentary book called The Firm, Extraordinary Firm Administrator. Both great books. I highly recommend them. In The Extraordinary Managing Partner, John includes, oh, a dozen, maybe 15 examples of job descriptions for managing partners. Um, you might want to take a look. If you go to managingpartnerforum.org, we've uh, got a collection of three or four job descriptions for managing partners. I think it helps them uh, better define their roles and what's expected of them. Here's our data from the 180 managing partners I mentioned that we collected our conferences. Fairly similar to what you all said here on the call, about two-thirds of firm leaders don't have formal job descriptions. This speaks to succession planning for the managing partner. Do you have an exit strategy? What are you going to do uh, when you want to abandon the managing partner role? What's your game plan? Three-fourths admit, I really haven't thought that through. Um, interesting. CEO of a multi-million dollar enterprise, and you haven't thought through what's going to happen when you uh, want to retire or move on to something else. Our next polling question speaks to strategic planning. I believe every uh, firm, regardless of size, should have a firm-wide strategy, something in writing that sets forth where we're going and how we're getting there. So let's see how you all respond to this question. Does your firm have a written strategic plan? And looking at the votes coming in here, about half say no, about a fourth say, yeah, we've had one for quite some time now. Let's go ahead and stop the voting. So more and more firms are starting to pay attention to this stuff. Uh, running the firm as a business. Yes, it's a profession, and we should never lose sight of that. But I think every law firm needs to contemplate that we are a business, and we need to think and act more like a business, and let's like a loose confederation of sole practitioners. Uh, we find about 60% of firms do not have a firm-wide strategic plan. Um, and here's some interesting data. If you think your firm needs a strategic plan, you're trying to push that idea to the partners. Uh, this is 180 managing partners weighing in. Of those firms with a plan, does it improve performance? 89% say yes. Planning equals improved performance. And often performance is looked at in terms of profitability, growth, cohesiveness, sustainability. Um, strong arguments to think about a firm-wide strategic plan if your firm does not already have one. So there's our polling questions just trying to set the stage that it's important that a firm plan for the future and as a part of that plan uh, address succession. And ideally, our senior partners, like our father or, or a, a, a senior figure teaching his kid to ride a bike, uh, until you get on the bike and start pedaling, you don't know what it's like. 
Uh, but ideally, our senior partners are helping our younger partners appreciate leadership, rainmaking, all the soft skills they don't teach in law school that are important, increasingly important to running a successful law firm. And as you're teaching the young lawyers to ride the bike, you, you, you put them on the bike. You give them chances to lead, uh, to make rain, and you celebrate their successes, much as this gentleman is doing for the young man on the bicycle. Uh, celebrating success, teaching our young lawyers more than just billing time. Uh, you know, the ABA has a model diet for associate attorneys, and it contemplates for associates 2,300 hours all in, 1,900 billable. And it breaks down those 400 billable hours and how they might should be invested. Marketing, leadership, uh, service to firm. Uh, so here's the ABA suggesting that a well-rounded associate's diet consists of more than just billable hours, but there is leadership, organizational and community involvement, mentoring, rainmaking, all those sorts of things. And our young lawyers, our senior lawyers are supporting this and, uh, and, and helping, helping those junior lawyers become more effective. When it comes time to pass the keys from the senior to the junior, it's smooth, it's orderly, um, and we're not looking at something like this when our founding partners retire or our major rainmaker at 67 decides to hang it up and we've done nothing to transition his client relationships. And uh, often I see this a lot, once great law firms uh, falling by the wayside due to a lack of planning, a lack of succession. I think sustainability is important, and uh, is your firm a legacy firm or a mercenary firm? And if your founding partners want to see the firm survive, uh, it's, this stuff's really, really important. Seventy percent of first-generation firms don't survive their founding partners. That's an alarming st st statistic. Seventy percent of first-generation firms don't survive their founding partners, often due to a lack of planning. It's not intentional. Just we haven't planned for the future. Uh, firms tend to look to the past, tradition, the way we've always done things around here. Uh, well, if you haven't noticed, things are a-changing. And uh, if you're not evolving and adapting and planning for the future, um, I think that's a fairly, fairly short-sighted approach. A few war stories. Uh, I've been dealing with succession planning quite a bit the past couple of years. Uh, more and more, it seems, and I've been speaking on the topic, writing about it, and uh, people are calling me. Uh, this marketing and business development stuff I preach does work. I practice it myself. A couple of war stories. Here's a, a firm in Alabama, founding partners. Uh, we're doing a planning exercise. One of the senior partners, name partner in his 80s, and, um, you know, kind of losing it. And um, some days better than others. Um, you know, associates don't want to be around him. He comes to the office every day. Uh, clients don't want him working on the files. And we, as part of our planning process, I meet with partners and we do online surveys. Number one pressing issue is addressing our senior partner, time for him to retire. Number one issue, named by every lawyer. And here we come to the firm retreat, and they don't want to talk about it. They tried to have the firm retreat and not tell him. Well, he found out. How do you think that went? Uh, that firm is dissolved because it wouldn't address a very difficult issue involving a founding partner. It's a shame. Great firm, no longer. Here's a firm in uh, Tennessee, uh, the founding partner in his day, great trial lawyer, built a hell of a law firm. They did a lot of defense work, multi-offices, uh, well into the dozens of lawyers, and the founding partner moves into his 80s, and he became a benevolent dictator, but as he aged, he got a little less benevolent. And anyone who would challenge his leadership, his authority, he'd run them off. And young lawyers were starting to bail ship, bail from the ship. And uh, he had two sons that were at the firm. There was a little nepotism in there, and it was the two sons that led the charge to, uh, to, to uh, oust the founding partner. Very difficult, very difficult process, very emotional. But that firm is thriving now because they addressed that tough decision. And I liken it to the mighty oak in the forest. Mighty oak grows big, large, but in so doing, tosses off a lot of acorns, takes the sunlight, 
the nutrients, the water, and the young saplings beneath it don't have a much of a chance to grow and flourish in the shadow of that mighty oak. And the mighty oak falls, and those young saplings now, with access to light, nutrients, water, flourish. And that's what's happened with this Tennessee firm. Another firm in Virginia I worked with last year, uh, the franchise. He wasn't the founding partner, but he was the franchise, the managing partner, the rainmaker. He cared. And he had a heart attack at age 62 and quadruple bypass surgery. And he left the firm for six months, and the firm almost fell apart in his absence. And once he recovered, he came back to the firm. And guess what his number one priority was? Create a succession plan so the firm would survive him. And we took some very deliberate, concrete steps, and that firm today is thriving and uh, in a much better place uh, as he uh, starts to admit younger lawyers to the executive committee and starts to step back and, and, and have a shadow managing partner learning how to lead a law firm. Here's another firm in upstate New York, uh, an Eat What You Kill compensation system, origination credit for life. Uh, I don't like origination credit for life because senior partners tend to hoard and control until the very end that origination credit. It is not conducive to transfer sharing, teamwork. And here this firm had an 82-year-old senior partner who wouldn't let anything go, wouldn't let any uh, junior partners have access to his clients. He was their uh, deleg uh, uh, designee to their law firm network, 82-year-old guy showing up, and uh, not interested in stepping aside in the least. Uh, needless to say, that's causing a lot of angst among junior lawyers, and uh, we'll see where that firm goes with its situation. Um, but those are some concrete examples of firms that have dealt with succession, some successfully, proactively, others ignoring it, and as a consequence, uh, an ingredient perhaps of the, to the uh, uh, disintegration of the law firm. As we look at succession planning, as I mentioned earlier, I think you know there's a couple of couple of things to think about here, and the first is ownership of the firm. And David Meister talks about this quite a bit in his book True Professionalism, and if you haven't read it, you should. Uh, Twelve bucks on Amazon, and it's a great book. And I often uh, purchase it in conjunction with a strategic plan or an upcoming firm retreat. Great concepts in there, the importance of investing in the firm's future, billable hours for today's income, what we do with our non-billable time determines our future, um, and much more important than the billable hours would argue Maester. Um, he talks about dynamos and coasters, and are we building a firm that attracts and retains dynamos, tomorrow's leaders, or are we maintaining a firm that tries to uh, prop up its senior partners and allow them to... Uh, perhaps take out disproportionate income, uh, have disproportionate say in decision making uh, because they they're senior, uh, but they're they're getting ready to retire, and oftentimes I find that these folks need a little bit of push. Um, are we building a firm that accommodates those senior partners and the way we've always done things around here? Perhaps senior partners that are slowing down and taking a disproportionate share of income. That frustrates your dynamos, and if you do that too, <laughs> too much, too long, uh, your dynamos start jumping ship. So Maester talks about the importance of evolving and building a culture that attracts and retains your dynamos. Um, I am shocked at the number of mid-sized firms that ha now have de-equitization, mandatory de-equitization provisions in their partnership agreements. Uh, just about all the AMLAW 200 do. Uh, at 65, 67, 70 years old, uh, you are moved from equity to uh, a non-equity status, uh, perhaps an up-counsel role. And we can make dis you know, uh, exceptions for certain partners, but our policy is at 65, 67 years old, uh, there is a deacritization to make room at the top for our dynamos who want their bite at the apple. They want to see an opportunity to become an owner, to become a decision maker. And if the senior guys are holding on too long, too tight, uh, it does frustrate your future leaders who will be carrying your firm in 10 years, 20 years. Uh, we want to make sure they stay. They're challenged. Uh, they see an opportunity to become uh, an equity partner and ultimately uh, a decision maker within the firm. Um, 
at, at one of the roundtables at last year's Managing Partner Conference in Atlanta where there was a discussion about uh, uh, mandatory retirement, and I was surprised. I was sitting in the room with uh, uh, managing partners, 25 to 30 lawyer firms, and two-thirds raised their hand when asked if whether there were mandatory de-equitization, mandatory retirement provisions within the firm. So something to think about. Uh, Two-tiered partnership structures. About 70% of mid-sized law firms have um, uh, non-equity partnership tracks uh, to accommodate work-life balance, to accommodate uh, you know, talented technicians who don't bring it all as an owner. They're long-term employees. They're good lawyers. Uh, but uh, they're not all in as an owner, and more firms are starting to spell out the criteria to become an owner, an equity partner, or a non-equity partner, and including book of business, firm citizenship, leadership as criteria to become a firm owner. You know, no longer hanging out seven, eight years, meeting your minimum billable hour requirements, that's not enough to get in anymore. Uh, more and more firms are defining those criteria and looking for owners uh, who think and act like owners, uh, not just long-term employees, if you want to be a, a, an equity partner. Uh, as I start work with the firm, I'm often very interested in votes to admit new partners, votes to expel partners. And um, firms starting to lower those thresholds. And um, what are the votes to amend our partnership agreement? So we can de-equitize senior partners who aren't performing. Uh, we can... Uh, make room at the top for our young, talented dynamos who want ownership. So firm ownership, and what are we doing to uh, some lawyers retire very gracefully? They know when it's time. Uh, others you know, might need a little push for the good of the firm. A and this is tough because often these senior partners are the founding partners. Uh, they hired and mentored a lot of the younger lawyers now who are stepping into partnership. But for the long-term sustainability of the firm, it's really, really important, I think, to help senior lawyers retire when it's overdue, uh, to make room for your young dynamos who are going to carry your firm into the future. This is tough stuff. But if you care about the long-term sustainability of your firm, you know it's something that, that firms need to pay attention to. Moving on to leadership and governance. Um, are we giving our young lawyers an opportunity to learn leadership skills and know how firms operate? They don't teach this stuff in law school. Uh, most lawyers don't recognize it's $150,000 overhead per lawyer on average, $150,000. And folks just don't realize the economics of a law firm. And I think they don't learn at law school. It's incumbent upon your firm's to, to help your young folks understand uh, what it's like to lead a law firm and lead lawyers. Um, we saw the important role of the managing partner without a job description. Uh, personally, I like the title CEO, Chief Executive Officer. You're running a business, and there's a difference between leadership and management. Leadership involves vision, motivating people to change, big picture stuff. You know, management's more kind of keeping the trains running, day-to-day -day admin. And managing partners need to do more leading, generally speaking, and less managing. Uh, most don't have a job description. They haven't been taught how to lead an organization in law school. But there are resources out there. And uh, I think it's important that uh, firms, and, you know, adopt strong uh, leadership and uh, efficient governance models. And so the notion of your managing partner is CEO, your administrator, that would be most ALA members, the COO of the firm, our executive committee, our management committee, most mid-sized firms, you know, we've got our equity partners. Uh, they meet from time to time. But if yours is a firm where all the equity partners meet every month to talk about administrivia, make decisions on day-to-day -day stuff, very inefficient, very expensive, very time-consuming. Uh, most mid-sized firms have gone to executive committees, management committees. How they're constituted, it varies by firm. I like elected. I like term limits. And here we can affect some churn. 
and bring young lawyers to bear on our management committee, our executive committee. Uh, and it's not the same senior lawyers elected time after time and after time with little churn. Uh, you want your young lawyers to learn about leadership, learn about governance, get them involved, engage them. Uh, some firms will uh, set up forced representation on their management committee. Uh, our, our, let's say our equity shareholders, 50 years and less, uh, can vote a member of the executive committee, um, and they pick that member. Um, so there are mechanisms in there to uh, bring young, long, young lawyers to bear uh, within your executive committee, your management committee. If we look to department heads, practice group chairs, our committee and task force chairs, uh, oftentimes firms appoint the senior lawyers to these roles or the lawyers with the big, big books of business to these roles. And they may or may not be uh, the right people to lead groups. And there's a difference in the skill set between an effective rainmaker and an effective group leader. You know, group leaders uh, think firm first, think what's in the best interest of the group. You know, often rainmakers think uh, what's in best, their best interest of the individual as opposed to the group. Good team leader runs a meeting uh, effectively, efficiently. Good team leader is a cheerleader. Good team leader is a disciplinarian as well. And oftentimes the senior lawyers, you know, they may be very good, but they may not. So here's an opportunity to, uh, to identify and groom future leaders and put them into these roles at the committee department level. Uh, I've worked with a number of firms where the head of the department will be a senior lawyer, but they'll be a deputy chair of, of the group, often a junior lawyer. And that's not a bad way to expose your younger lawyers to leadership uh, and group dynamics. So uh, think about who you're plugging into these important roles. Uh, think about opening up your executive committee to your younger lawyers. Uh, think about a job description for your managing partner. And uh, that helps tomorrow's firm leaders recognize what goes into that managing partner role. It's not easy. And I've heard many managing partners say, I spend 75% of my time trying to practice law, 75% of my time trying to lead the firm, and my partners have no idea what I'm doing <laughs> and how much time it takes uh, invested in the managing partner role. So uh, some things to think about in terms of leadership, governance, and succession involving these areas and getting your young lawyers, identifying them, grooming them, and, uh, and teaching them those leadership skills. Put them on the bike, for crying out loud. You can read about leadership and, uh, until the cows come home. But until you're out there riding the bike, um, you know, give them, give them those shots. Uh, set them up through uh, deputy leader position, deputy leadership uh, titles, or, or department heads practice groups. I put organizational involvement in there. We'll talk a little bit about it. But here's a great place to give lo young lawyers leadership exposure to leadership is uh, through, the, through organizations like the local bar, the chamber, um, and they get involved in committees and task forces, start chairing meetings and such. So maybe they can achieve some leadership governance skills and, uh, and uh, experience uh, through organizations in which they are uh, members. Another important aspect of succession involves our relationships with clients, prospective clients and referral sources. And we don't want our relationships with these important folks to retire when senior partners retire. Uh, it's really, really important that our clients get to know, like, and trust junior lawyers uh, as the senior lawyers, you know, start to wind it down. A couple of facts. Clients hire lawyers, not law firms. Study after study will bear that out. There are always exceptions. But generally speaking, clients hire the lawyer. And they hire the lawyer they know. They like, they trust. And if the only lawyer your client knows at the firm um, retires, the only lawyer they know, like, and trust isn't there anymore, um, <laughs> they probably go shopping. So let's make sure our clients are getting to know, like, and trust younger lawyers working on their matters because the younger lawyers have been exposed to the opportunities to develop relationships, get to know the client. Uh, not just on matters but on client site visits, when we go visit the client, partner, take an associate under wing and go visit that client. So the associate gets to know the people, 
it's a people business after all. Clients hire the lawyer, not the law firm. And uh, so get them out there involved in your marketing and business development activities, mixing and mingling with clients. I think in a concept, you know, as senior lawyers move toward retirement, usually their contacts within your big institutional clients, the general counsel, the CEO, uh, they're moving toward retirement as well. And we want to make sure our younger lawyers are developing meaningful friendships, relationships with, with their peers within your institutional clients. So that your 40-somethings are getting to know the 40-somethings at your big institutional clients. So that as they move into leadership positions, you guys haven't missed a beat, but your younger partners uh, have built those relationships and your client has come to know, like, trust other lawyers at the firm. Origination for life is not conducive to transferring client relationships. Um, I think that client teams are something that firms set up, and if you've got big, big clients and you want to make sure our younger lawyers are getting to know their counterparts within the client, client teams, client-specific events, um, you get the idea here, I hope. I, I like industry practice groups as well. And let's plug our young lawyers into those industry groups. So we've got senior lawyers working with junior lawyers out there cultivating relationships with folks in a position to hire and refer. Women, minorities as well, they need to be part of the team, clients more and more. I don't think it's lip service. They want to see diversity, a commitment to diversity, a lot of smaller and mid-sized law firms are challenged in this area, um, attracting and retaining women and minorities. And I think it's really, really important. Your clients want to see this. And uh, are we doing some things proactively to uh, accommodate the Gen X, Gen Y, millennial crowd, uh, to uh, uh, work with our women lawyers and uh, making sure that... Uh, uh, they are part of our leadership. Um, important stuff to consider in today's market. Transition plans for senior lawyers. I do have a template. If anyone's interested, shoot me an email. Happy to share it. But uh, I've worked with a number of firms at, say, 60, 62 years old. Uh, we're going to ask our senior partners to submit a senior partner transition plan. Uh, and what are you doing to start to uh, bring uh, younger lawyers to bear on your client relationships? What are you doing to transition your skill set to younger lawyers? Get specific, and then let's hold you accountable to a transition plan, which looks at fewer and fewer billable hours and collections and more mentoring, more transitioning uh, to younger lawyers, uh, and a compensation system, importantly, that supports this. Uh, that senior partner is rewarded for transition not hoarding and controlling. And uh, firms are really starting to take a look at this as well in the context of, of succession planning. Uh, Daisy, I'm kind of I'm looking at the questions over there. If there's anything you see you want me to talk about, please, please don't hesitate to interrupt because I'm, I'm, uh, I'm kind of looking at that we have a few, but I haven't read through them yet. So if you see anything we, we should look at. Uh, bring it to mind. Uh, only if you feel that you need to. Otherwise, we'll wait for Q and A. Okay. Um, another thing we want to make sure uh, survives our senior partners is their knowledge, their skills, all those tips and tricks they learn through decades of practice. And is that being transitioned to our young lawyers in a proactive way? Um, I encourage senior lawyers to, you know, see yourself as a teacher, a mentor, and how you can help those younger lawyers uh, learn from you as a role model, as a mentor, uh, not just holding it on till the end and then, and then not sharing it. We watch all that knowledge go out the door to shame. And I think we can look at the, the, the legal skills, you know, how to take a good deposition, how to go about a cross-examination, uh, you know, taking that young lawyer to trial. So hard to get young lawyers to trial anymore. But when we do have those opportunities, man, they want to just sit there and learn. And, and that's a non-billable drill. 
but but are we doing this so our young lawyers do appreciate what goes into you know a preparation for and an execution of a of a trial and passing those legal skills on to our younger lawyers you know let's look at forms documents you know all those things we collect and and many smaller and mid-sized law no these are my documents uh, you know, no, they're firm documents. And do we have a document library? These are good tasks to put senior lawyers on. You know, build our forms library, build our documents library. Let's capture all of your expertise and skills and make sure it, it transitions and, and, and our younger lawyers learn from all of that because we've developed that forms library or that document library. Um, so so uh, that's on the legal skills side, the billable stuff which is important for today's income, but the non-billable stuff, the marketing. I, you know, I, I've, I've gotten to know so many senior lawyers who are just brilliant rainmakers and little tips and tricks that they've learned over the course of their 40, 50-year career, little things that often young lawyers just don't think about. Uh, they're not taught it. They're not trained. They don't think it. All the firm cares about are my billable hours. So I'm a proponent of, of tracking the non-billable time for your associates. The ABA suggests you should do that. 400 hours worth of non-billable time. Not just, you know, go do stuff, but focused, deliberate, thoughtful investment of non-billable time. And the big areas we see in law firms in, in, in these days are marketing and the business development and, and leadership. And... Um, you know, are we transitioning those skills? So why not have one of your senior lawyers, your best rainmaker at the firm, uh, have a little in-house seminar for your young lawyers where he or she uh, passes along those tips and tricks learned over the course of a career that, that work, this stuff works. Uh, I, I think the leadership as well and having your young lawyers when it comes to, I mentioned organizational involvement or on an earlier slide, and I'll share with you a couple examples of a firm I worked with in Miami, uh, Commercial Litigation Boutique, uh, the Florida Bar, specifically the Board of Governors of the Florida Bar and leadership, president of the Florida Bar, were really, really important to that firm. And always having presence and always, you know, they get a lot of referrals through other lawyers around the state of Florida. So they've identified the Florida Bar as a key organization. And as the senior lawyers move through the leadership ranks, Man, opening doors for those younger lawyers and, and kind of paving the path for them to follow through the leadership ranks in a very deliberate, proactive strategy. The first firm I worked with in-house in West Palm Beach, Florida, Gunster Yokely, uh, an, uh, one of our important institutional organizations was the Business Development Board of Palm Beach County. And this was the organization that attracted new business to the region and helped the existing business grow. And very fertile environment, and it was an important organization for the firm. And so we joined at the highest level, whatever it was, the Chairman's Club, 50000 a year, whatever it was. This is back in the mid-'80s. Uh, but, man, we had our senior lawyers. I mean, it was a very institutional strategy vis-a-vis -vis the Business Development Board, and our senior lawyers in, were helping the young ones up through the ranks. And so here's a way uh, we can, um, um, you know, help transition and, uh, and use our senior lawyers to, uh, uh, you know, exploit opportunities in organizations in which they become leaders. Processes, procedures, firms, documents, forms and documents, intake, you know, how do I spot a good client? You know, that's not necessarily a science. And, uh, you know, uh, I find that a lot of smaller and mid-sized firms have very sloppy intake procedures and, and then wonder why they have a, a receivables problem. Well, you, you didn't get an engagement letter signed, and you didn't get a big retainer, and you let the client get ahead of you. Well, you know, that's not tough the stuff they teach in law school. So maybe our senior lawyers can help our younger ones spot a good client and how to intake it and onboard it and, um, and collect and make that call when, uh, when they haven't paid the bill. That's a hard call to make. Most lawyers don't like making it. But, uh, you know, we've got to get paid. I think it's as well important as we transition our uh, institutional knowledge and our expertise that we've got the technology in place to uh, support that. CRM, 
contact relationship management. That's our database. Uh, not each lawyer with his or her list. And our retiring lawyers leave. There goes that list. No, we've got a firm database, and we're all, you know, kind of mining our con uh, our contacts and coordinating uh, our relationship building activities. So CRM uh, to support teamwork sharing uh, among lawyers, and um, you know, a forms library, a document library. You know, there's a there's a gazillion um, uh, systems out there where we can we can archive this important information. Um, I'm just looking through a few questions here, Daisy, and um, good materials I'd recommend to facilitate a firm going through strategic and succession planning. Uh, I think tr uh, that, that True Professionalism book is a good one. Uh, if you go to managingpartnerforum.org, uh, we have a whole section on succession planning with all sorts of articles and checklists and all that good stuff. Um, I've got some articles on strategic planning as well that might be helpful on that website. And then within our materials, the handout materials associated with this webinar, uh, I included some articles uh, on strategic planning, succession planning uh, that might be helpful. And feel free to call if we can help or, or that doesn't answer your question. Examples of equity and non-equity partnership agreements. Do I have examples? Uh, nothing I can share. <laughs> um, I have dozens and dozens of these on file. Um, I don't have a generic example I can share. That was a question. Uh, please send me your senior partner transition plan. We'll do that. Um, so that's to answer a few of the questions on the list. Um, talk a little bit about organization and, and community involvement. I mentioned faces of the firm, who you trotting out there. Is it your uh, septuagenarians and octogenarians? Or is it your young dynamos, your 40-somethings, your 50-somethings who uh, uh, endure uh, confidence and trust on behalf of clients and prospective clients? Uh, I like individual marketing plans. I do have examples of that I'm happy to share if you fire off an email. Um, nice templates. I think if we're going to push our people out to market, it's not random acts of lunch and golf. There's some specificity. Uh, let's 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 you know let's be proactive and thoughtful and strategic about where investing our time. I think an individual plan helps do that. Um, we talked about organizations and and uh, you know the a, a team approach, senior and junior lawyers. You know moving through our key organizations. Uh, I like I, I think it's important to make non billable time matter. Uh, Peter Drucker, one of the leading organizational behaviors in our time, talks about what gets measured gets done, what gets measured improves. So the concept of individual plans, tracking the time, tracking the expenses, we're starting to measure stuff. Uh, we're taking it seriously. It's more likely to get done. It's more likely to get better. Uh, dressing for success, a separate topic altogether, uh, but I think young lawyers especially look like a lawyer, and I would suggest that's a suit and tie for men and an equivalent for women. Uh, whether you like it or not, people size you up real fast and uh, based upon what they see, uh, they make an assessment, whether they like you, don't like you, or are kind of ambivalent. So why give up <laughs> an opportunity to make a good positive first impression, look like a lawyer? And I think that's particularly important for younger lawyers. Here are the emergency situations I mentioned. I shared one war story with you about the firm in Virginia uh, where the, the, the franchise basically uh, had that heart attack and it almost tore down the firm. Key man insurance, uh, just be ready. And, um, you know, stuff happens. And I, 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 Gunster was good at, we had a point person, uh, so that something bad happened. Uh, lawyer left or lawyer was involved in something or a client left. Uh, we don't want reporters calling just any partner at the firm and having that partner talk to a reporter. Uh, we had a designated point person, our CEO, uh, who would uh, be our communicator both to folks within the firm, what was going on, and outside the firm, to the media, to clients. We don't want our clients reading about uh, uh, one of our partners, um, you know, uh, in the newspaper. Uh, we we want to, we want to get to our clients before the press, and uh, so let's make sure we've got a plan in play in the event of an unforeseen emergency. 
Um, this is a true story, and it's a sad story, but true. It'll drive home my point. Uh, senior partner at a law firm, um, been pulled over on a couple of DUIs over the years, and on the way back from a firm event, he got liquored up at the firm event and involved in an accident involving deaths. And uh, how do you handle that? Not a good situation, and the media is all over it. And um, they had that point person. They got word out to the clients before they saw it on the 11 o'clock news. So um, think about these things, these unforeseen problems. Daisy, I'm looking at the time. We have about 10 minutes left. I'll quickly hammer through those points, then we'll open it up to questions. Change is all around us in the legal profession. We got a tidal wave of change. And, you know, when you're in the midst of, this, of, of, of the wave, it's hard to see it. But these changes are coming at us. Uh, 2008 accelerated a lot of these changes. We're not going back to normal. There is no more normal. The way we used to things around here, the profession's evolving, and the pace of change will continue to increase. And uh, you all know what's going on. Um, I think it's important that we have a plan. We have a vision we know where the ship's going, and we're starting to run the place more like a business. Hope and pray is not a good strategy in leading a law firm in today's uh, rapidly changing market. Disruptors, people often ask me, that's about the fifth bullet point down, bullet point down, disruptors. What's that, John? Uh, that's LegalZoom. That's Rocket Lawyer. That's Avo. Uh, they're coming at you, and uh, they're nipping at your heels, taking away work from lawyers. If I don't have to go to a lawyer for a landlord-tenant agreement or a simple estate plan, I'll go to LegalZoom and avoid that. Record level of M&A activity changes all around us. And where do you think lawyers are when it comes to adopting and evolving? Uh, innovators, early adapters, laggards. Well, here's how most lawyers deal with change and what's going on out there.